Hello and welcome everybody to this Front and Center Podcast Extra. We are going to be talking to Tom Pirion, a contributor to The Unshackled and a colleague of mine, who was at the Milo Yiannopoulos event in Melbourne, Victoria, and is going to tell us a little bit about what happened. Before we begin, I should state that I am not at all uh, a fan of Milo Yiannopoulos, and obviously I disagree with the protesters who started out uh, just expressing their free speech and their unrest when it comes to this issue and turn to violence. These are some of the images that we have from the Melbourne protest. So without further ado, let's get to the interview. Hello, Tom. Thank you so much for being with us today. We understand that you were at the Milo Yiannopoulos events uh, at the time of the violence, and we were hoping that perhaps you could give us a little bit of insight as to what it is that happened during this event. Yeah, sure. So I rocked up prior to the show probably around about 7 p.m. or somewhere thereabouts. So the show was scheduled to begin at 8 p.m. So I was there a little bit early. And when I arrived... Um, Basically, there was a, a massive line of police who were uh, fencing off a group of um, left-wing protesters. Uh, the left-wing protesters were just harassing people um, upon entry and yelling abuse and whatever else. Um, apparently, prior to my arrival at the event, um, there had been a, a physical confrontation between um, a man called Neil Erickson, so the, the leader of a local right-wing group, and a, um, a few others. And anyway, uh, when I rocked up, yeah, there wasn't actually any violence occurring at the time, but obviously tensions were high, and yeah, there was a lot of um, abuse being hurled from the left towards those who were entering the venue. So when you arrived at the event, the protesters, they're already there, and they're just, you know, chanting and doing uh, the things that they're legally allowed to do, which is just show their unrest. When does it escalate from being just a show of remorse and uh, not accepting that Milo Yiannopoulos is speaking to actually uh, inflicting violence upon other people? So I believe they uh, apparently arrived there at around about 6 p.m., I was told, so two hours before the event actually began. Um, so they, yeah, they made an early start. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm under the impression that they arrived early because they wouldn't harass people upon entry. Um, and also to be there to, to get them afterwards, hence why a lot of them stuck around after the event as well. Um, but yeah, it was it was quite interesting because it was a, a combination of not just the you know the typical sort of Antifa crowd, but you also had um, a, a group of people from the uh, basically there was a, a a housing commission estate like a, you know government housing across from the venue. So a lot of these uh, the the residents of this particular housing commission had actually come across the road and joined in the protest. Um, so you had a, a combination of, yeah, you know, the, the typical Antifa crowd and a lot of these, I think they were Somalians as well, were also joining in on the protest. So you see the protesters and uh, obviously the type of protesters that we can come to expect at these types of rallies at a rally like Milo Yiannopoulos's would be the Antifa people uh, who are easy to identify because of their covered faces. Uh, oftentimes they're wearing all black and uh, sometimes they have the, their logo, which is the, the two red flags. I'm wondering, though, if you saw any other organized uh, demonstrators, if you will, people that were there not as individuals protesting the event, but actually were there as uh, part of a collective. Yeah, um, I mean, there were people there wearing, uh, you know, Make America Great Again hats, so the, the famous Trump hats, um, who were attending the rally, oh, sorry, attending the, uh, the speech. Um, as for the protesters, um, there were a lot of women there wearing the, um, what do they call it, the, the knee carb, I think, the, the head scarf. Um, I assume they were the, uh, the residents of the housing commission that I mentioned earlier. Um, but no, apart from that, I don't think there was really a consistent trend in regards to the uniforms that they were wearing. Uh, none that exactly um, you know, caught my eye anyway at the time. So there are protesters there uh, initially, and it seems like they are caring about their legal right to express 
uh, their dislike for something, and obviously there's nothing inherently wrong about doing that. I'm wondering at what point does it go from being this uh, legal exercise of free speech and turn into the violence that we saw, that you saw firsthand, but that we saw uh, through a screen? Yeah, uh, well, as I said, um, based on what I was told, there was a, a violent confrontation prior to when I had arrived. Um, having said that, once I arrived, that um, situation had simmered down. So I believe that was Neil Erickson, a famous um, right-wing provocateur with a, a few people from Antifa. Um, but from my own personal experience, though, when I left the venue at, I think, around about 10 p.m. or maybe a little bit earlier than that, um, basically the, uh, the police who were there made sure that each of the people who just attended the show um, turned left and went down a, a different street rather than heading right and heading towards the main road where the protesters were. Anyways. Ironically enough. What was that, sorry? Yeah, you turned left. Yeah. <laughs> Is that ironic? Okay. Right? Yeah, um, no pun intended. Anyway, so, yeah, so we, um, we went left and um, um, I'm walking past the housing commission and I look over there and there's this massive commotion going on. Um, so more or less what had happened was the uh, police who were equipped were um, engaged in a, I suppose, a confrontation with um, the residents of the commission. So they were you know, throwing bricks and rocks and whatever else. Um, and they were actually forcing back the police, um, more or less. So the, the police were forced back across the other, to the other side of the road. Um, so this is, as far as I can tell, while I was inside, the um, protest had blown out into a, a full-blown riot, more or less, between the residents of the Housing Commission and the Victorian police. Um, so as I, yeah, as I said, I was um, walking along that main road. I saw this unfolding. I decided to whip out my camera phone and start recording some of it. Um, and, yeah, no, things were getting crazy. There was a, a police chopper up above us filming, or, sorry, monitoring um, what was going on. And, yeah, it really didn't feel like the Australia that I've grown up in. It felt like, felt like something out of, you know, movie, um, I felt. So as you're standing there, uh, I think that a lot of us are, are trying to think about the magnitude of this uh, protest or this uh, mob that you saw. So can you give us a rough estimate, a guesstimate, if you will, of how many people were actually there clashing with the Victorian police? Yeah, look, I would guess anywhere from three to 500 of them approximately. Um, I mean, it was crazy. You only had maybe 100 cops max, um, so they were significantly outnumbered there. Um, and, yeah, there was just no regard for the law, no respect for, for anyone, really. I mean, I, I really feel bad for the people who live in this um, in this area, Kensington, suburb of Melbourne. Um, yeah, it was just insane. Like I said, they were outnumbering the police. They were forcing them back, and it really just wasn't a, a safe situation for anyone to be in. So obviously you were you were the victim of some violence during this, and uh, I'm hoping if you don't mind uh, telling us a little bit about how it went from you just being a an innocent bystander to actually being someone who was being targeted for this uh, this violence. Yeah, no, sure, I don't mind. Um, so basically, I, as I mentioned before, I was there uh, filming the events with my phone at the time, and I was probably there for a good twenty minutes or so, just getting some of this. Uh, some of this stuff recorded and at some point I, I don't know how exactly she went about doing it but there was a an old lady maybe in her 50s or 60s who uh, for whatever reason was behind the uh, the police line and was walking towards the um, uh, the residence of the housing commission um, so she was walking towards them and I, I, I'm under the impression that she had just attended the Milo Yiannopoulos show Anyway, she starts walking over there and she starts confronting them. So she's yelling and, um, I mean, i, I got to give her credit. It was quite brave on her part to do this. Um, but anyways, there would have been about, I don't know, 10, 15 of them spearheading this group at the front who started uh, you know, pulling on her hair and spitting on her and slapping her in the face and whatever else. Um, anyway, at this point, so prior to this, I'd probably been maybe, I don't know, 20 to 30 metres away from everything that would be going on, sort of filming from a distance. At this point, though, I got a little bit closer. Um, I, you know, I was sort of worried for this woman's safety. So as I got a little bit closer, I was still filming everything as it was unfolding as she was being, you know, spat on and assaulted and whatever else. And next thing I know, there's a um, one of these people slightly to my right. He grabs my phone out of my hand as I'm filming. And I'm sort of, you know, taken by surprise. And then next thing I know from my left, there's a fist 
gets me in the face. And then before I know it, there's about six of them on me, um, you know, bashing me, you know, hitting me in the face and whatever else. The guy with my phone has run off, you know, into the crowd. I, I can't see where he's gone. And, yeah, I think there was anywhere from six to ten, uh, to ten of them simultaneously um, laying into me, you know, kicking me and, you know, punching me and whatever else. I ended up going down and they're still getting me when I'm on the ground. Uh, fortunately, there was a photographer, I think he was, nearby, an Australian man who was able to um, to intervene and, you know, drag me out of there and get me to safety. Um, but, yeah, it was a situation where, which was really quite terrifying because, as I said before, the cops had been forced back, so the cops couldn't really do anything at that point. Um, as I said, there was 10 of them who were laying into me. You know, behind them you've got a, you know, a crowd of, as I said, three, four, five hundred people. Um, it was, you know, it felt like a near-death experience at the time. So I'm just, I'm thrilled to be, to have gotten out of there and only have a few bruises from it. Um, obviously I lost my phone, as I mentioned before, so I'm, I'm filming this just on a, a temporary phone that I just got for the time being. Um, but yeah, I, I had my shirt ripped, um, covered in bruises and scratches. Um, and yeah, it's really just, you know, as I said before, it's, it's not the sort of thing I've experienced before. Um, I mean, I... You know, I've grown up in Australia, and for me, it's the the sort of place where, you know, you wouldn't expect someone to violently assault you, let alone, you know, a gang of, you know, that many people to be picking on one person like that. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just crazy, and for me, it's something I've never experienced before. So, yeah, it definitely wasn't a, a positive experience for me. So, obviously, you attended the event uh, not as a journalist uh, per se, but also just uh, on your free time because you enjoy. Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos and you think that his ideas are pretty good. You you like what he says. So I'm wondering if there was anything that would have indicated to these protesters that you were one of the people that was actually attending the event, uh, such as a MAGA hat or something. Was there anything descriptive about you in that moment that would have let them know that you were one of the people that went to the Milo Yiannopoulos event uh, just to, to see and not as a journalist? Yeah, so as you mentioned before, I mean, I am sympathetic to the cause. I obviously had purchased a ticket for the event, having said that the uh, the outfit which I was wearing was just jeans and a black t-shirt. There was nothing distinguishing which I was wearing which would have identified me as a sympathizer. Um, even if I was, I don't think that really justifies any of their actions. Um, but no, nonetheless, I was simply just a, an innocent bystander who was, as I said, recording um, their actions on my phone. Um, I assume it was either, yeah, either my decision to film their actions, which set them off, or maybe it was a racial thing, given that this was a, a crowd of Africans and they were targeting white people. I, I can't say for sure. Um, but no, there was, there was definitely, yeah, there was nothing that I was wearing, no indication that I was, a, I was sympathetic to any particular political cause. Interesting. Yeah, I, I can't really imagine that there would be a group of people who would show up to... Uh attack people based on their race if uh, part of the reason that they dislike Milo Yiannopoulos uh, so much is because of some of the more racially charged Thanks things for that tuning in said. to Front and Center. But that being Please said, visit uh, when someone takes your phone away, for all uh, the ways do you to think that that person and the show? was Don't doing so because free he did not want the, the actions of uh, him and people like him to be documented uh, online? News or do you think that it's more that he decided to take advantage of the chaos and just to be able to snatch your phone, run away with it, and just essentially uh, keep your phone? Yeah, look, I I suppose in regards to the particular individual who snatched my phone, perhaps those were his motivations. Um, I would assume that if he saw me filming, you know, him and his um, associates, you know, bashing and spitting on and pulling an old lady's hair, he probably thought that, you know, from a public relations perspective, it wouldn't be overly positive to have that one film. Um, as the ones who then ensued to bash me in a, a group of 10, I, I'm not sure if they saw me filming or if they, you know, what exactly their, their motivations were. Um, I honestly, I don't think there's too much, you know, reason and thought, which has gone into the, the actions which they've um, carried out here in this situation. Um, but yeah, I, um, I, I wouldn't really, you know, I couldn't give you a definitive, a definitive answer in regards to the, the motivations behind their actions. So as far as I'm concerned, I, yeah, I would assume that the fact that I was filming their actions probably didn't exactly help my case in that regard. Um, but yeah, once again, I can't really say for sure, to be honest with you. Right. Well, I guess just to finish up, what we could ask you is, 
Obviously, a lot of the people that went there to protest Milo Yiannopoulos uh, went there because they believe his speech uh, and his rhetoric constitute as violence. And that's why they go and they basically want to stop the event because they believe that this is, a, this is a, a, a legitimate form of violence. I'm wondering if you have an opinion regarding how a group of people that believes that this type of rhetoric is violence can then go to an event such as this and actually inflict real physical violence on people. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, look, I once again, I mean, I can't really say for sure, but um, based on conversations with I, which I've had with other people since the event and based on uh, certain you know observations and investigations which I've had, I believe that the, um, I suppose the official narrative is that uh, the Antifa organisers apparently um, more or less you know, did their best to rile up the residents of the Housing Commission. I don't know specifically what was said to them, um, but regardless, so there was, yeah, obviously hundreds of people from this neighbouring Housing Commission who were there at the event, so I'm going to assume that the anti-paper organisers had uh, said to them, you know, come out and oppose this guy because he's a, you know, a Nazi or a white supremacist or whatever else. Um, but no, look, I, I don't think that, that really excuses their actions. I would, I would have hoped that, you know, any sort of... Um, you know, a grown adult would have been capable of, you know, doing their own research and reaching their own conclusions rather than just dismissing Milo and any of his supporters as being Nazis or white supremacists. Um, but, yeah, that does seem to be very much the standard narrative which I you know, have encountered based on the conversations that I've had with other people. All right, Tom, well, this brings us to the end of the interview. Uh, obviously, we, uh, we are so grateful that you came on Front and Centre to tell us a little bit more about uh, your experience and uh, what happened to you. Obviously, we are more than grateful that uh, you uh, came out of this looking like you're in good health. Uh, you know, luckily, you know, with 10 people beating up on you and uh, you coming out of this with just a couple of bruises and a lost phone, uh, you were clearly very lucky. So uh, we're, we're very thankful for that. So we will expect to have you back soon. And thank you so much for contributing with us. Great. Thanks, Amelia. My pleasure. Thank you.